thoughts on it we'll get started so um good evening everyone thank you for giving up an hour and a half of your time this evening to speak with us um it's my pleasure to in introduce the clinical innovators group and just to give you some context um this was kind of grown up over the last six months and the idea is that clinicians and managers in healthcare will increasingly have to lead innovation adoption but also be the creators of innovation themselves and we hope to provide some informal education on the new horizons in healthcare AI, genomics, and so forth, with the idea that we democratize access to innovation and that everyone from the nursing staff, the doctors, and the managers all feel actively uh, participatory in adopting innovation at GSTT and beyond. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Nadine, who's our Director of Innovation, who can give us a little context on today's seminar. Thank you. Hi everyone, it's great to see so many people attending on a on an even on a workday evening. Uh, my name is Nadine Hashash Haram. I'm a consultant surgeon at Geysers and Thomas's, but I'm also the clinical lead for innovation across the trust. And it's so, so exciting to continue to see so many people engaging in these events because really the Clinical Innovators Network started as an idea around how do we engage and encourage and enthuse our frontline clinical team, staff, and other members of the wider team. Um, to, to be aware of what's going on, to get to get excited, to get involved, to ask questions, to be curious, and hopefully for us to find ways to share knowledge that's really sitting and siloed across certain pockets of our organization. What's really exciting to me as a, as a clinical innovator myself is that, you know, we are at such a transformational time um, looking at that intersection of healthcare, innovation, academia, uh, and to some extent, um, private capital that's going around in the market. I think in the last quarter, that was the biggest amount of investment that happened into digital healthcare and technologies around healthcare. So it's important that we get up to speed on some of these uh, topics, these hot topics, understanding the, the importance of them, the clinical benefit, the benefit to our patients, to our workforce, the ethics around them were relevant as well, but also showcasing and sharing the, just the great talent we have in house and recognizing today that, you know, at GSTT, uh, we've built great, uh, and at King's, we've built great partnerships. We've built great relationships with industry partners, but we have great uh, leadership in, in, in some of these technologies, as you'll see from the panelists today. Today, of course, we're talking about how AI is transforming healthcare, and it's very relevant given that just last month, Her Majesty's government launched the UK's national AI strategy to really think about how we turn Britain into a global AI superpower within the next 10 years. This, of course, includes a commitment to consult on a draft national strategy for AI driven technologies in health and care through the NHS AI lab. But also recognizing that a lot of the key stakeholders and individuals that have been involved in shaping some of these strategies actually exist on our own campus here between King's and Geysers and Thomas's. And whilst AI has the power to really rewrite the rules of how healthcare potentially operates, significant barriers still exist to adoption and expansion. And ultimately, as a clinician myself, it's not so much about the technology itself, but how is it actually bringing value? How is it transforming healthcare for our patients, our workforce, uh, and all the members of the broader kind of healthcare and social care team? Today, the Clinical Innovators Network is really delighted to present the first of what we hope to be a three-part series on AI and healthcare, because it, there's a lot to, to kind of dig into around that topic. And today, we're very, very lucky to have really three expert practitioners discussing both current opportunities as well as future challenges of AI in the UK and global healthcare scene. I know that any introduction I do will not fit, fit sort of the service to these people because they've really been vanguards in the work that they've done. But I'm very, very excited today that we have with us uh, Dr. James Teo, who is the Clinical Director for Data Science and AI at KCH and GSTT um, and the NHS, and he's chairing this event in the series. We have Dr. Chris Kelly, who's a clinical scientist at Google and also a clinician uh, within our own hospital at Geisel St. Thomas's. But we also have Dr. Rob Brisk, who uh, joins us and hails from NVIDIA, which of course, as you know, is a very strong partner to our ecosystem. And we were part of the launch of the Cambridge One uh, supercomputer that kind of um, opened or, you know, had this special unveiling uh, some months ago, which I had the, the real luxury and pleasure to be at myself. So without further ado, and I don't want to take away from the spotlight of these three great panelists and speakers, I'd like to hand over to James, who I would call a dear friend and a colleague and one we're very proud to have in our organization. So over to you, James. 
all, all right. Uh, the, so um, I have the honor of chairing a session and speaking at it, which is a slightly awkward uh, situation, uh, very rude. So I'm not going to uh, uh, necessarily uh, be, uh, some someone was going to have to keep me to time because I'm not going to be watching my own clock. Uh, so what we will first do is we have a, a series of three talks followed by a panel uh, discussion with Q&A at the end. So do uh, obviously put your questions in the chat, but we should, uh, uh, but we will be trying to address them towards the end rather than during the session itself. Okay, so I'm just going to start sharing my screen now, and this is where the technology will be tested for. And does everyone see this slide? Yes, yes, I presume so, because no one has objected. So uh, the, uh, I'm going to give you a, a beginner's overview. Uh, some of this, uh, if some of you here who work in AI already will find this uh, perhaps a bit simple, but I think it's important that we have a good overview of what a, uh, AI is in healthcare rather than AI in general, and we know what we're talking about, because as I'm sure we, we all know, uh, that there are different people have very different expectations of what AI is. So uh, I've got a number of uh, interests, uh, re receiving research funding from a number of uh, 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 external, external funders, as well as uh, these following uh, uh, conflicts of interest. So what I'm going to talk about first is what is machine learning in AI? How does it work? Then how can we use it for patients? What are advantages and disadvantages? And then we're going to go on into uh, talking about, you know, doing some AI. So this is the landscape that's facing us in terms of data and AI platforms in 2021. As you can see, every single one of those logos is uh, a service or product or company or startup, and the landscape is very, very, very complicated and very, very uh, co uh, confusing. And they all provide different aspects. Some of them are AI, some of them provide features, uh, uh, to, to support creating AI, some pro provide search and some provide many, many other things. And it's very, very confusing, particularly if you, even if you're in, an expert in the field, to, to keep track of what's going on, because many of these entities appear and disappear with a lifespan of a, of a, of a fly. So, but behind the hype, the patients are already benefiting from simple AI systems. I'm going to tell you about a story about an actual patient. This is a patient that uh, I have been involved in personally. So this is a 70-year-old woman who was found by her son at midnight, collapsed in the bathroom with right-sided weakness and being mute and unable to speak. She was rushed over to King's College Hospital at 2 a.m. And she was seen by the junior doctor in the, the, in the emergency department and was triaged to the stroke pathway and was brought rapidly to the scanner within minutes of arrival. And now, if you if you know anything about strokes, uh, you'll know that what uh, there's a phrase: time is brain. Every every minute that the brain is starved of blood, uh, mi uh, two million brain cells die. And the aim is to achieve treatment uh, within three hours. And so, uh, when the patients get scanned, this scan arrives, uh, is performed, and then an an algorithm from a commercial AI company uh, uh, processes the images and then produces these colored maps on top of it and scores it. I get this alert on my phone at two, at maybe 3 a.m., uh, a lovely time, and I review the pictures myself and I instruct the second scan. In parallel, a radiologist reviews this as well. And this, this, as you see, the colored area shows that this area of small damage which occurs, which is scoring a nine out of 10. So that there isn't that much damage occurring as yet. The second scan is done, and this second scan is read by another AI. This AI uh, looks for a large vessel occlusion, a clot blocking a blood vessel, causing the stroke, and is, is a large vessel occlusion. And you can see that highlighted there in a uh, little circle as well. And this uh, accelerates the reading of the image because uh, the actual raw images, as if you look at CD angiograms, uh, can, can be uh, can consist of hundreds of slices. I then I see the clot, and I instruct a third scan to run a third AI. And this third scan is a CT fusion. And this CT perfusion scan is read by a third AI, uh, which then looks for the pink areas, which are the areas where irreversible damage has already occurred. So even if any treatment is provided, uh, these areas would be damaged permanently already. It would not be, uh, be salvaged. 
But then the green area shows the area that can be saved, and then it shows the mismatch, the area that the salvageable area, and therefore treatment would be warranted. And so the patient progresses to uh, stroke thrombolysis and thrombectomy and clot retrieval. Uh, if we have pr proceeded to do this when there is no salvageable brain, we put the patient at risk of causing uh, bleeds and, and complications without any uh, measurable benefit. So from arrival in a &E to the start of the correct treatment, after those three scans and the AI interpretations and clinician uh, uh, evaluation, uh, it took a total of 24 minutes. So this is a pretty impressive uh, time, uh, time span, and that difference in time that saved is the difference between someone in long-term nursing care in a nursing home being artificially fed for all their meals for the rest of their life to walking home with a son a week later. So this is what uh, AI can accelerate uh, the treatment for. So this, that is, as I said, that, that uh, is uh, the one, a dramatic scenario, but I think there are many other potential bits in, uh, where AI can uh, supplement what we do in healthcare. Now, what is machine learning in AI? So this part is where we go into a little bit of basics and definitions. Well, uh, I'm sure lots of people have seen lots of versions of definition of AI. But the way I frame it is AI is software that behaves in an intelligent manner. Not necessarily intelligent in a human way, but it, it behaves in, a, in an intelligent manner which pro provides more information. Software that follows a series of instructions, an algorithm that is built around a formula or model. And this formula model that feeds the algorithm is generated by machine learning with data. So AI is the end result of machine learning with data. And then it's a, a software tool that can be used. So the way, the way, the way medicine uh, in the last century has, and software development in the past has always been about getting some data, running some software on it, and making a prediction. Uh, even rules-based software uh, like decision trees and, uh, uh, and, and such often use a, a human topic expert to hard code some rules, some kind of yes, no, yes, no logic to create the software and the software does this, this prediction. That's a traditional form of software development and, and classical statistics. Uh, machine learning put, uh, uh, flips this on the head. What happens is that you take some data and you take some uh, results of what has happened, some real world data, and then use it to generate the software. The, the instructions, the algorithm is uh, learns from the data and the outcomes to generate, uh, uh, to, to kind of uh, program itself to a certain degree. And then once you've got that uh, blue instruction and software, then you, 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 you can take it to, to different data and, uh, and apply it. So another patient in another scenario, and then it makes a prediction. So this software in a sense is able to, to program itself to. Uh, if you, have, if you have sufficient quality data and result, uh, and outcomes together and, and what we call ground truths. So how does AI work? So that broadly speaking, there's supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Supervised learning is where uh, someone teaches the machine and gives it the output and then unsupervised learning when machine randomly cl clusters, well, not randomly, it clusters the data together, uh, but without necessarily a human intervention. There are many different algorithm types, and there are more every month or every quarter. And it's not it's not necessary for a non-expert to know, know about all of them. But uh, it's important; it's, it's worthwhile to know that they exist, and they all have very very different names. And these algorithms all are uh, uh, when uh, when deployed and trained on data, it can then be used to do other things. The strengths and weaknesses. Well, the advantage of many of these AI systems they are very good at finding patterns. But that's actually also a disadvantage because it can be too good at finding patterns. So it's patterns that we don't anticipate seeing, like, uh, like uh, we might see detect biases within the, the, the data, which are we, we have, uh, is not easily perceivable to, to, to us ourselves. But it can handle very high dimensions, so I see lots of input variables. Classical statistics often handle three, four, five variables at once, or maybe even 10. But uh, uh, many of these AI systems have handled thousands, millions of variables and they can handle nonlinear relationships and clusters. However, AI systems that are developed are, is, are only as good as the data they are trained on. It works only for the tasks that it's designed for, and the meanings of the patterns that it sometimes discerns isn't always uh, uh, meaningful to a human, and it needs a human to interpret it. And there is always the risk of uh, hype preceding uh, actual use. So how can we use AI for patients? So uh, broadly speaking, there are all different types of data at the top here. Numbers, pictures, text, time series, 
uh, kind of pathways and genomics. And within each, each kind of category of data, you, you can have uh, uh, the different ways that it can be used. For example, the simplest kind of things are risk calculators, which takes a bunch of numbers together and kind of computes the likely outcome, uh, likelihood of someone staying long in hospital, likelihood of the people developing ulcers, uh, pictures, which uh, is an area which is of, of immense interest, what we call machine vision, to try to look at scans and interpret scans uh, automatically or triage them in some way, or retinal scans or cancer cells. Uh, text, which is natural language processing to interpret things uh, 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 with, within normal uh, English, uh, the English language. Uh, and th these other more on the right are more sophisticated uh, approaches, which I I'm sure uh, my other colleagues will exp expand on later. So uh, one type of AI uh, algorithm is, that's important to know about is these deep learning networks, which are designed around uh, new, uh, artificial neural networks, which, which are mimic the, the function of a bit of uh, mammalian neocortex. It's very good for pattern recognition, but it needs huge volumes of data uh, to, 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 to pr produce any uh, 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 good, uh, accurate uh, 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 predictions. Next is uh, the thing to know about is natural language processing. It is, this is designed for reading digital text. Uh, I have the honor of being able to have developed Cogstack and, uh, and various NLP tools uh, within KCH and GSCT and the Mosley Hospital to perform many of these tasks to do the reading of the text for us. Uh, obviously, there is a lot of language AI for normal English, but uh, as we know, clinical language is very different with its own jargon and its own uh, 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 acronyms and uh, a manner of, of, of describing certain things. And there are knowledge graphs which try to represent words and concepts and ideas within networks, and it allows uh, machines to interpret uh, what, uh, what a human means when it refers to something as a pneumonia. That pneumonia is something that happens to a lung and it's a, a clinical finding and it's, all this sits within an ontology system, which we, we uh, and the, the, the widest used one in the world is Nomad CT, which we are in the process of trying to implement. So we're gonna, we all see all this exciting technology and say, let's do some AI now. Let's quick, let, let's get these, some, some of these, those many, many products that we saw on, on the first slide and try to, let's get them into use. What we end up in this scenario is that uh, you'll, we, the hype kind of precedes the, the actual uh, reality. Uh, you, you, to proceed to actually making AI, you need to do many things before AI's things are ready. The hospital is ready for AI. So the hospital needs to modernize infrastructure to be AI ready. This infrastructure is not just the desktop computers that you click that takes a bit of a while to load up and log in. These are, a lot of this infrastructure is at the back end and a lot of it is not physical. These wires, these network wires that you see all the way at the back, uh, these are just some examples of, 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 of the kind of bits that we do not see from the front end, from the user end, but these are some of the things that, physical things that we need to sort out. So to make a hospital AI ready, you need to kind of think about these non-physical things. And these non-physical things is what we spend a lot of time working on. So the hierarchy of needs for AI, AI is a, it's a data-driven technology. Uh, data is the foundation of it all. You need to get the data, your data systems working properly first before AI. You can deliver effective data science, the effective analytics, effective AI. And to make AI, you need to pull, sort, and clean and arrange data to train the, the, the algorithms. But to use AI, you need to be able to do that continuously and rapidly all the time. So in a hospital, an organization needs a culture of good data, not just more data to make things work. And this is what we have to uh, think about with, with as, as individuals within working within an organization. And the way to think about data is data, if you look at the top there, no, data is like lots of little Lego pieces scattered everywhere in our organization that we input in lots of little, uh, little uh, apps and uh, web browsers and spreadsheets and such, and it's scattered all over the place. It needs to be pooled. It needs to be then structured in following certain terminologies and standardized uh, uh, dictionaries. Then it needs to, meaning has to be assigned to it. Then it has to be uh, cleaned, rationalized, and then it has to be applied. And the various programs that we see in GSTT all address various stages of this with the Apollo program working on trying to get the data at the source in a structured format as much as possible and pooling them in one place. We use SNOMED 
And Cox Snack to try to provide meaning to the data, to attach ontologies and terminologies to it, and then AI systems, AI set developed by the AI center to, to work on scalable deployment. And AI Center, uh, some of uh, the, uh, the members of the audience may, uh, may be involved with it, uh, is based at, on the St. Thomas's campus and is involved in development of technologies that we allow, allow medical imaging AI to be developed and used and maintained. The key bit is to be maintained, to be maintained as well. Without such systems, you, if you buy a, you know, an AI product and just deploy it in, in an isolation, it's, going, it's, it's not going to be deliver the benefits uh, in, in a scalable way. And so these AI deployment engines and federated learning platforms are being uh, constructed uh, within uh, the, the, the server rooms and in, in, uh, in the cloud and such to, to facilitate a lot of these uh, technologies. So how do I get involved if, you, if you're not an AI researcher, you're not an AI clinician enthusiast, but how do you want, but you want to be involved? You don't need to code. To, to be to, to, to use AI, you don't need to, uh, to code to, to, to necessarily be involved in AI projects, but you need to know about data. Uh, healthcare data is good. You know wh what kinds of practices that you perform yourself in your daily practice to make sure that data is entered correctly at source, arranged appropriately using standard terminologies. You need to avoid data ending up in little kind of spreadsheets. Uh, uh, that how you keep on your on on your uh, your on your document folder, which no one else sees. Uh, when buying software products, you need to ask yourself, ask them some difficult questions. Tell us about your competitors. As you can see, there are, there are, there are thousands of these companies out there. Will we will we get our data back? Will what will it cost us to deploy and maintain these systems? And how how do, are we going to be able to do that? Even if the software is free, if, even if it's uh, for a proof of concept, you need to make sure that it can be deployed and maintained. And you need to find commonality. So you need to learn the language and culture of other professional groups. Doctors need to learn to speak to, 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 to learn the language of nurses and how they handle the data. Nurses need to learn how, uh, how doctors do it. Likewise, Eli health professionals, medical physicists, clinician scientists, a variety of different professional groups. And you need to understand informatics people as well. So this is uh, AI projects are complex systems. They're not software designed for one or two people. Uh, and so uh, standalone systems are, are really going to have great difficulty to roll out. And so these are, this is the way to help, uh, I believe, that the Clinical Innovators Network will allow this sort of thing to happen, to get all the, the right people in the room to start talking to each other. So that's uh, my presentation. So uh, I'm going to move on now to the next speaker, uh, who is uh, Dr. Chris Kelly. He's uh, a clinical scientist working at Google Health's Artificial Intelligence Imaging and Diagnosis team, who's also working part-time here at uh, St. Thomas's Hospital in the neonatal ITU. Uh, I'll, I'll let him expand a little bit more about himself. Um, I'm not sure if I managed to hand over the slides. Um, yeah. Hi everyone, can, can you see that? Yes, Chris. Great stuff. Um, hi everyone, um, my name is Chris. Um, so I work at Google Health, but also at St. Thomas's. I thought I'd give you a quick bit of introduction before I start so you know where I've come from. Um, and it's really good to be here. So I started at St. Thomas's in 2014 on the neonatal unit um, and did a bit of research while I was there, which led to AP at the Centre for the Developing Brain as part of the Biomedical Engineering Department at KCL and spent uh, three years looking at brain development um, in babies with congenital heart disease. This is my first MRI scan, which is of a, a raspberry uh, from m and downstairs. Um, and here are some of the brains that we scanned. Um, and during that time, I got really interested in AI and healthcare, how it might impact upon uh, the, you know, the future. And actually, this is before the AI center. Um, and so I struggled to find um, someone who could be a sort of good mentor for me and was looking around. And at the time, there was DeepMind doing some quite good work um, just around the corner from where I live. And so after lots of badgering, um, I joined DeepMind in uh, 2018. Um, and since then, I've joined the Health AI group at Google. So this is a group of people who are trying to um, apply artificial intelligence techniques to medical imaging and all sorts of other medical data. Um, and it's based sort of um, in various places around the world. And so that's where I am now. And so 
to kick us off, uh, this is a quote from the New York Times. It says, artificial intelligence is by turns terrifying, overhyped, hard to understand, and just plain awesome, which I quite liked because I think I agree with all of these things. I'm quite looking forward to maybe 20 years time when AI is actually quite boring. It just works. Um, we don't really have to talk about it very much. And I'm sure that probably will happen actually over the course of my career. Um, but I'm just really interested in the, in the journey from where we are now, where this quote is probably true, to where we could be in say a couple of decades time when this actually really is making tangible differences to patient care. So actually James just did this as well, but I guess just say it once again, you know, AI is maybe the science of making machines smart. Within that, you've got machine learning, which is sort of teaching mach machines to be smarter by example. And then deep learning, a particular type of machine learning, which has been pretty powerful in recent years. And so what is deep learning? Well, it's all around us. And this is some, these are some Google examples. Um, it wasn't that long ago that you couldn't search for dogs in your photos and up popped all your dogs or you know, one of your children throughout various levels of different, you know, all these different ages all combined together into one uh, search. Or you couldn't, you know, replying to your emails in Gmail or Translate. Um, Translate is a really nice example where they had 15 years of development, tens of thousands of lines of code. It worked quite well. It was superseded by about 800 lines of code, a deep learning model, lots of training data, and a massive improvement in the, tra in the translation quality, all by just moving from handcrafted features to, um, to deep learning. And so at a very simple level, like what is it? Well, you know, you're, you're training by example. So in the, in the past, you would have thought, right, what makes a cat, what makes a dog? Uh, if you, you know, you'd handcraft some features, right? So a cat has got whiskers uh, and this, this shape nose. If you have both of those things, it's probably a cat. Um, in the new world, you'd feed all the pixels um, of the image into the bottom layer here, the input layer, and each layer learns successively more complicated features of the image. So it starts off with very simple features. By the end, each, la each layer builds on the layer before until eventually you're actually, have, you've got quite complex concepts by the final layers. And by teaching you know, a thousand cats and a thousand dogs, the algorithm starts to learn the best way of differentiating between them. And so you know, put in there a melanoma and a normal, normal mole, same as a cat and a dog really, um, and you can start applying these techniques um, to some sort of health problems. And so can we apply these advances to real-world healthcare? Well, James has just said yes. The New York Times also thinks so. Um, but, you know, can we actually? Um, the interesting thing, it really has sort of become much more possible over recent years. And we're seeing like this rapid democratization of all the techniques. So um, here's a paper from 2016 in JAMA about looking at um, um, diabetic retinopathy photographs. You know, a year later, an academic group did the same thing, but in lots of different populations. Uh, then Moorfields, uh, a couple of years ago, did a really nice paper showing how clinicians can set up, can train models with no coding experience using something called AutoML, which is made by all the different, different big tech companies. Uh, you can upload your data sets. It picks the best model for your application and actually just sort of really makes the whole thing quite straightforward. And this may be, a, may be the future of how this might go. Or even uh, this really nice story about a high school student who trained his own breast cancer model uh, as a teenager and it worked pretty well. So th these techniques are really becoming mainstream and you can just imagine what the potential might be. One thing that surprised everyone is things that the computers can see that human eyes, the humans can't see. And a really nice example of this is a paper in Nature Biomedical Engineering, which showed that you could tell whether someone was male or female from a retinal photograph with near perfect accuracy. And so this sort of stunned everyone a little bit because um, you know, we've had ophthalmoscopes for 150 years. Nobody knew you could do this. So, it's, I mean, it's not very useful. You just have to ask someone if they're male or female, really. To, to, it's not a terribly useful thing. But the, the fact that you can actually do this is interesting. And this paper also looked at cardio risk, cardiovascular risk factors. Um, um, you can also do things like anemia or blood pressure or you know, sort of things that you really couldn't tell from a photograph yourself. And it just opens your eyes to what other things are in images um, that we can't see that the computer can. And surprisingly, despite we now know it's possible, and it's been replicated by groups all around the world, um, humans still can't tell if this particular uh, fundus image is from a male or a female. So you know, think about ECGs or all these other things. What other data do we collect routinely that has got hidden signals in? That might be useful in the future. And so many papers about healthcare and ML, um, translation into products is much slower. And so why is that? And so, you know, I guess one of the questions is, you know, why is this gap between expectations and reality? And, you know, the translation actually is actually much harder than it seems. And so 
for the last part of the talk, I was just going to talk about a few, a few of the myths in building and translating AI, AI models, which might be a nice sort of um, starter for some discussion. So the first one is more data is all you need for a better, for a better model. And you know the, the natural tendency is well, well, the performance isn't very good. Let's just add some more training data. So to give an example here, um, Google made a model to look at diabetic retinopathy images, and to do that, they got 130,000 retinal photographs, 54 ophthalmologists, and got them to label the images multiple times, resulting in almost 900,000 reads of these retinal images. And that was the, the, the development set for the algorithm. And the idea is, looking at retinal photograph, can you um, can you say whether it's normal or as it, you know what what severity of diabetic retinopathy is it? Challenge is is ground truth is more subjective than we think. This is this is my favourite figures, and we actually have T-shirts of this figure because we thought it was really cool. Um, so the, the, uh, for those of you who haven't seen this before, the co columns in this image are different ophthalmologists, and I think it's got about thirty something ophthalmologists, and they all read the rows, which are uh, thunderous photographs. And so if you look at this here, so the top row here, you know, many people thought this was normal, blue. Uh, some thought it was mild, some thought it was moderate, and one called it proliferative, which is the most severe form of diabetic retinopathy that requires treatment, urgent treatment. Uh, the bottom here, you know, uh, here some have thought it's proliferative, some have thought it's mild. You know, people really can't agree. Um, and the integrator, you know, so uh, people, they agreed with each other 60% of the time. And when you ask them to do it again, do it again a month later, which we did, uh, they agree with themselves 65% of the time. That's not very good. Um, and it turns out that you know when you're training a model, you have to tell them what the truth is. You know, what is the ground truth? If the ground truth is is this uh, subjective, it's very hard for the model. Imagine taking your sort of four-year-old child and saying, this is a lion. No, actually, no, it's a tiger. No, 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 it's a lion. No, 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 it's a, it's a tiger. They're going to get so confused. Uh, if you're consistent, you're going to get better results. So to highlight this in a bit more data, so um, the team took the training set and um, trained on like different different sub, you know, sub samples of the data. And you can see that as you get down to the small amounts of data, um, you know, performance drops. But actually, when you get to about 50,000 images in this particular case, performance plateaus. So probably adding more data in this particular setting wouldn't make the model that much better. However, um, if you look at sort of the quality of the labels, so the training set is the, is the set that's actually, the, you know, use the training set and the tune set. And the training set, um, on average, the whole data set had four and a half grades per image. And if you just take out, just take a random one, so just take one grade per image, it actually doesn't really change much if you do it for the training set. This is the set that's actually um, being used to um, uh, set up the weights of the algorithm. The tune set though, as you add more and more people, um, more and more opinions to the tune set, you can see the performance really jumps up. So I guess the takeaway is if you have limited resources, invest in the tune set, not the training set. And this was actually shown nicely between 2016 and 2018, where the model went from the performance of a general ophthalmologist to the performance of a retinal specialist. And perversely, they did this by actually using a smaller uh, tune set, but with really, really high quality labels. So they got retinal specialists to get into groups of three. Um, they all had a go. If they agreed, great. If they didn't agree, they went into rounds of adjudication and sort of banging them on the head until they all agreed um, what the what the truth should be. And if they couldn't agree, the image was thrown out as an image that no one can really agree on. And by using a very high quality, smaller tune set, you actually get better results. So I guess the the, the summary of all of this, it's not necessarily it's not all about quantity, or quantity is important, but also quality of labels is really, really important for a better model. And it's sort of intuitive. So the next one is you know, an accurate model is all you need. Well, so taking that algorithm into the real world setting has been has been interesting um, for the for the for the team. So looking at how doctors and nurses really use it in in the clinical setting uh, is very eye opening. And so in this particular um, setting, the trial was in Thailand and India. So these are settings where the there's a real shortage of ophthalmologists, and it was as part of the National Diabetic Retinopathy Screening Program, looking at whether this is a feasible thing to do. Um, in 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 the in, this, in the real world setting, and they took a mixed methods approach and really trying to understand the barriers and opportunities for this technology. And it was summarised really nicely in a paper that is worth reading. Actually, it's like a, it's actually a pretty interesting one about translating AI from a sort of lab setting to real world. And the team went out to Thailand and uh, sat in clinic and everyone who was taking the images. 
really interesting. So in these nine different clinics, they had different practices, different settings, lighting. I don't know if you've ever had an eye exam done, but you know, dark room, quiet, peaceful setting, it makes a big difference. Some had a dedicated room, some didn't. There's a huge waiting room of people, you know, hundreds of people waiting, lots of time pressure. Uh, the internet went down, uh, technical limitations. And then really interesting, a difference between what a human would call a good quality image and what an algorithm would call a good quality image. So here's an example where a nurse tries to take a picture of a, um, of a retina and couldn't get one whole picture. So instead took two pictures, one of the top field of the view and one of the lower field of view. And I suppose if you combine them in your head, you can be relatively confident that you've captured most of the important parts. But this is not what the algorithm is expecting. The algorithm, algorithm is expecting a really high quality picture from um, of the whole field of view. And so this leads you know, to actually almost 20% of images being inadequate for the um, for the algorithm to process. So without really understanding what the problems are, you wouldn't have really picked up on that problem. So it's not all about accuracy, although the accuracy is important, but also you know, usability and workflow. And then the next part is you know, a good, you know, all of these alone is sufficient for clinical impact. Well, not necessarily. I mean, so the in this again in this particular setting, people are traveling for days to get to the clinic. And so you know, this might involve you know, lost wages or have to find childcare. You know, can you reinvent the system in some way to make care closer to the people who want to access it? Can you make accessibility, you know, through AI, can you improve the accessibility of technology screening, for example? So just you know, really need to rethink how you might do things. And also thinking about the health economic side of things. Um, really for these things to be adopted at scale, you need to do high quality health economics assessments to, to show that there is benefit. And there's a nice paper here from SERI, which is a Singapore Eye Research Institute, where they're looking at what might work best in their setting. And it's like a nice sort of a nice model for how you might go about this. So it's not just about um, clinical impact, but really thinking about what the impact is from the wider system. And so I rattled through the talk. I hope I'm hope I'm on time, but um hope that was an interesting introduction to some of the work we've been doing. Um, I'm happy to take any questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, and I think uh, the next uh, speaker is Rob Risk. Uh, who, was, uh, who works with N NVIDIA, one of the uh, uh, foremost computing co uh, companies in the world, uh, manufacturing the, the key tools and infrastructure for training these AI systems. Uh, and uh, I'll let him introduce himself further with, with his, in his presentation. Thanks, James, and, and thanks, Chris, for a great talk. So, as uh, can, can you hear me OK? I can see you, James, if you can give me a thumbs up. Perfect. So great, thanks. As James says, um, my name's Rob and I work for NVIDIA. Um, and as you can see from this slide, I'm going to take things in a slightly different direction. I knew James was going to talk about NLP in his talk, and I knew Chris was going to do a fantastic job of covering some imaging ideas, which are two of the most important applications of AI to clinical medicine at the moment. So I thought it might be interesting to just consider kind of where all the different AI technologies and clinical care hit a confluence point where they feed into drug discovery and to talk about how, how AI is bringing the drug discovery process closer to the clinic and making uh, drug discovery more relevant to everyday clinicians. Before I do that though, and I'm going to keep this very high level, before I do that I'm just going to talk a bit about NVIDIA as a company um, and then I'm going to, oh excuse me I've, I've got my daughter over here, can you tell it <laughs> I'm going to talk about NVIDIA as a company and then just explain how I came to be working for them as, as a clinician. So it, there are probably three types of person in the audience. One type of person has never heard of NVIDIA if they're not very into tech. One type of person, probably a man of my generation, thinks of NVIDIA alongside video games. And then the third type of person in this group is growing all the time, kind of understands what NVIDIA is today. But NVIDIA started out like in the 90s as a company that invented and manufactured a very specialized type of computer chip that was really designed for doing computer graphics like you see in this, uh, this uh, screenshot of a video game here. That was their core industry base. This is, if you think about the, the I'm not going to go into much technical detail, if you think about standard computer chips called CPUs that run your laptop, your smartphone, most computer devices in the world today, they're like the GP of the technological world, right? 
a GPU is like the interventional cardiologist. It's someone that's a very, very specialized tool that does one job really, really well. And that job is crunching numbers all in parallel. So not like calculation one, then two, then three, all at the same time. In the early noughties, people in the scientific community began to get wise to this and they realized that some really important scientific applications, like say computational fluid dynamics or molecular dynamics, require exactly the same type of computing power as video games uh, and video games graphics. And they began to basically hack their software to use the, these graphics chips. And then NVIDIA got wise to this and started to cater for that audience. And that was really their stroke of genius, because in 2010, when AI really began to take off, and it turned out that AI needs exactly that same type of compute again, NVIDIA was the company that was kind of there making the chips, making the software to let scientific uh, applications run, and they just took off. And over the last 10 years, they've been on a stellar trajectory. But that ethos of we need to understand what people are doing with our platform so we can cater for those use cases has remained really strong. So as AI has grown into healthcare uh, and GPUs, NVIDIA chips are being used in this space for mm -hmm. applications like James and, and Chris have just described, NVIDIA has started building a team of people whose job is to bridge the knowledge gap, to do exactly what James said earlier, to speak different languages and bring them together and translate clinical knowledge into technical know-how. Uh, so that's, uh, let, I can't progress my slide here, give me a moment. So that's, that's NVIDIA as a company, just as a bit of background. This is a very standard kind of off-the-shelf slide we use to talk about why AI is important in healthcare. It's, it's about clinicians, clinical staff drowning in paperwork. It's about diagnostic errors. The comparison with the aviation industry is frequently cited where they've dealt with human error really, really well. We don't do it too well in medicine. And then drug discovery is taking a long time. It's getting more expensive and, and you know, things like XDR TV are a real cause for concern because there's no financial incentive for drug companies to create new antibiotics. All of this, um, all of this is, is, is very general context. For me, I've been in the NHS for 10 years when I got the call from NVIDIA, sort of five years in acute medical training, five years in cardiology. And I just got stuck out into the world of uh, the COVID response. I, because I was a computer nerd and a clinician, I, I joined the Department of Health to do some modeling of you know, patient flow and resource allocation. And at that period in time, when I got the call from NVIDIA, I, I was really kind of tuned into the fact that COVID was changing the landscape that we lived in and making people more open to this, to new technologies. But at the same time, we had a long way to go in terms of exactly those, those base layers of the, of the pyramid that James was talking about, our data ecosystem, the way we, the way we think about why we're recording data and how we're recording it, and, and the fact that we neglect secondary uses a lot of the time. So, R and D uses are, are, are not very well considered in medicine, and so I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll go and join this company for a while and I'll see if we can make a difference. And um, mm -hmm. uh, worth saying, actually, that, that, that GSTT is one of our key partners. GSTT is, is genuinely—I'm not saying this to blow smoke—is genuinely a global leader in, in health AI. I mean, really trailblazing, and so it's wonderful to be able to work with organisations like this. But what I found actually is that there are loads of great use cases for AI, some of which we've heard about today. But what's really exciting is when you think about the confluence point where they all come together. And actually, I think drug discovery represents this quite nicely because it's, it, you know, starts and ends with the patient. But between a patient presenting with symptoms and us delivering a novel therapeutic, we go all the way through loads of different technologies down to quantum mechanics and back. And so it's a great kind of common mission to start drawing technologies together. And, um, and really thinking about AI in a very practical way. So I'm gonna cover a, a couple of key concepts in, in, in the time I have left. One is I'm gonna talk about deep phenotyping because it's it's the point where drug discovery becomes really, really re relevant to what we're doing in clinical everyday clinical practice. I'm also gonna briefly segue into talking about protein folding because um, an organization that, that Chris worked for a couple of years ago called DeepMind, um, did something really spectacular last year in this domain. So I want to leave you with a sense of why drug discovery should be relevant to clinical innovators. I also want to leave you with a complete aside on why protein folding is so important so that you can impress your friends after today's meeting. Deep phenotyping. Right? If we think about how we do clinical medicine, a patient presents with signs and symptoms of an illness and we do detective work. We, we, we decide what questions to ask them, what investigations to do, and we dig down and we dig down until we arrive at diagnosis. Patient presents with chest pain. Uh, we ask them when their chest pains occur, and we think about echocardiogram and an angiogram. Sorry, my daughter again, guys. Uh, and uh, 
And then we arrive at diagnosis of, say, stable coronary artery disease. But that's just the beginning. If, if your mission is actually to discover a new drug, you've got to keep going and keep going beyond the clinical diagnosis, right down to the point where you've discovered a causative molecular mechanism for that disease. And that's really, really hard to do. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this slide. This is this is probably for a slightly different purpose where it just shows where AI technology fits into this pipeline. What I'm going to do instead is put this in more concrete terms. This is a story I, I really like of, of the Brugada brothers, three brothers, all cardiologists who um, who described a particular syndrome. Um, that, uh, and it's a great use case of how conventionally clinical the clinical world relates to, to, to target identification and drug discovery. So in the early 90s, two of the Bucada brothers described this clinical syndrome that they had noticed that there were some patients coming in and having blackouts. Some of them were dying suddenly. Some of them were having ventricular tachycardia. And they spotted that, the, that some of these patients shared this really unusual ECG finding you can see here. I won't bore you with the details of what's unusual about this ECG if you're not a cardiologist. But the point is these two brothers, based on clinical acumen and basically intuition, realized that there was this group of patients and who had defining characteristics that set them apart from the rest of the patient world. And that is still the foundational first step to, to, to anything you want to do in the world of precision medicine and drug discovery. And because these two brothers have defined this patient group, six years later, the third brother, I love this part of the story, the third brother, um, actually, who had gone really digging into this into this phenomenon, he managed to identify that there was a particular gene that was associated with these patients. I think it's called SCM50 or something. But what he did, he kind of he applied some scientific knowledge. He said, OK, this is an electrophysiological problem. I know that sodium channels are really important in electrophysiology. Maybe I could start looking at the genes that encode for sodium channels. And then it becomes a game of spot the difference. Let's look at the genes of these patients who we know have this disease. Let's look at the genes of everyone else who doesn't. Let's see where they're different. That's probably our target right there. That's that's the thing that we want to that we want to hone in on. And potentially that's the beginning of the drug discovery process. The, the point of this slide is that uh, this is really fallible. This is really brittle. Humans can only see so many patients in a lifetime and we're not good at spotting complex patterns in rich multimodal data. I mean, I mean, Chris just said it perfectly. It's amazing what AI can see that the human eye can't. And that applies to rich uh, clinical data that spans from signs and symptoms to bedside tests to physiological tests to imaging to labs to genetics. And actually, when we think about applying clinical tools in, in practice, and James, you know, the, the, the tools that James is working on, uh, like, like CogStack and MedCat and these fantastic tools, the change in the data ecosystem and the way we consider clinical data that, it, that, are being, that is being driven by these kind of tools is actually going to have a much more far reaching effect because it's going to allow us to apply AI, AI algorithms to that data to try and spot those patterns in those clusters within patient groups and to subtype diseases. Um, because for sure, there are many, many different types of disease out there that we're just not aware of because we haven't spotted the patterns yet. And then what's becoming very exciting is say you went, say you had an algorithm running in GSTT, you spotted, OK, there's a subgroup of heart failure patients, for example, who all share certain characteristics that a human might miss. Then you can cross reference those clinical features with, say, the UK Biobank, where the UK is also a global leader. And you could say, well, let's look at patients in the Biobank who have those clinical features and let's look at their genotypes. And maybe we've just identified a drug target. And this is getting very, very exciting from the from the perspective of honing in on precision medicine, medicine, doing deep phenotyping so we understand diseases at the molecular level and discovering new therapeutics. I, I don't have much more talking to do. Uh, I've probably got about two minutes left, I guess, here, James. Uh, yeah, great. So, so the last thing I just want to tag on to this very high level discussion is I'm not going to go into, into too far into this because this leads us into the world of quantum mechanics, which is what I'm having to get up on at the moment. It's making my brain melt. But just to say that that process of deep phenotyping in which the clinical programs and clinical innovators have a huge role to play, it leads on to a process where you have to design a molecule that binds with a protein in a certain way and inhibits that protein or promotes that protein. And that's the drug design process. A huge bottleneck in that process was getting from the point where you've got a genetic sequence. And as we all know, from a genetic sequence, you get messenger RNA. The messenger RNA gets transferred into an amino acid sequence, and then that's the basis of a protein. The really hard part there is how does that sequence of amino acids fold in 3D space into a protein that actually has a meaningful function in the cell? 
That's been a problem that's been plaguing science for years and years and years. And we've got some empirical methods like X-ray crystallography, cryoelectromicroscopy, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, super slow, super expensive, massive bottleneck in drug discovery. So this is this is the bit where it's uh, it's, it's purely an impress your friends that you know about this. But um, what happened in the last year is that two organizations, one of which is DeepMind, who, who, who Chris works for, one of which is the Baker Lab at the University of Washington, have produced algorithms that have maybe not cracked this problem, but made incredible progress in this problem. So that now all inside a computer, you can start taking a patient who's presented with signs and symptoms of a disease, mapping down to the genetic cause, folding the protein in 3D space in your computer, and then designing the drug molecule to bind that protein, and even taking a few steps towards working out whether that drug molecule is gonna be safe and effective in the real world. And this is finally, I think this is my last slide, I'm, I'm gonna skip over clinical trials. Final words, this technology is starting to become real. It's been, a, it's been a theory for a long, long time, but it's actually becoming real. It's getting to the point where we think it might work. And this is becoming incredibly exciting in the world of AI for healthcare. And that was, that was the most high level possible whistle stop tour that I hope has just given you a sense that actually drug discovery is not as far removed from the clinical front lines as we think, and AI is bringing it ever closer. I'm going to stop talking now, James. Hopefully I'm on time. Uh, thank you very much, Rob, for uh, being so uh, uh, strict of yourself. It's a great, it's a great talk. Uh, it makes the job of a chair easy, actually. Uh, so I'm very grateful. Uh, so now we're going to move on to, uh, to a, a panel-like uh, uh, conversation between Rob, Chris, and me, and others in the Clinical Innovators Network. Uh, uh, we obviously will we'll, we'll handle questions as well, but I, I think uh, to kind of kick off this kind of um, a conversation rather than a Q&A session, perhaps. Um, I, I'm going to uh, try to kind of start posing some of these questions so that we, we can discuss among ourselves. So uh, first question, I guess, is with uh, I, from uh, Michael Upsard, uh, which can clinicians and clinical academics add value to a space, to this space compared to the power industry? Well, um, I'm going to go first, then perhaps, I don't know, Chris, perhaps you might want to say, seeing that you represent the, 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 the behemoth uh, uh, in the industry. Uh, so I, I think we can. I, I think uh, certainly uh, we, are, we provide the ground truths at this stage. As clinicians and clinical acad academics, uh, the AI learns from what we do. And so we provide the meaning to the data to, to, to train these algorithms and therefore to a certain extent we, we, we can add a lot of value to it. The second bit I guess is about when at the deployment phase whether or not we uh, I can actually use it not just make AI but can we actually use it and that's where I think uh, we as clinicians and clinical academics and uh, healthcare professionals can do, do more but I'll let Chris come in now to tell me that I'm right or wrong. No, I completely agree. <laughs> um, I guess I was thinking, you know, you can imagine these big tech companies got lots of computer science engineers, all, you know, working away. But what really matters is like, is there a good clinical problem that's amenable to technology like AI? And actually, nobody working in a tech company has any real insight into what the problems are faced daily in a particular hospital setting, where around the world, wherever it might be. So I would say that the the clinician who is working on the front line is actually the most important part of the whole thing um, and not, not the tech companies. So um, in most of the work we've done, we've always worked quite closely with an academic partner, for example. And that's really important because otherwise you don't really understand what the problem is. Um, and also, you know, to, to do this well, 90% like of all the problems are not as glamorous as it might sound. It's basically just making data sets, really high quality data sets that requires really um, big insights into the data, like you know, where might things go wrong? Like imagining, you know, like where could be the problems with this data? I, that that can't be done by anyone other than a clinician or a clinical academic. And then the final thing is, you know, there's so much um, hype as we talked about earlier. But you know, if this if this is actually ever going to be used in the real world, then you have to have really high quality evidence. And that evidence, that high quality evidence, will come from independent clinical academics who are going to evaluate these things. And even with good quality evidence, I don't think these are ever going to get used in the real world unless there are clinicians, the pioneering champion, championing these technologies through the 
very complex contractual IG, everything else you might imagine in, in an NHS hospital, for example. So I think really, in summary, the clinician is the kind of critical part. Um, and without them, this technology won't really reach patients. All right. I, I, do, you, do you have anything that comment add to, about that to, to that, Rob, or should we? Uh, only to emphatically agree. So uh, yeah, ha happy to move on to the next one. <laughs> okay, let's go for. All right. Um, um, let's see. Uh, uh, how can we best place ourselves and dive into health? AI and machine learning research use as medical students. So this is a probably a question from someone who is on the cusp of entering the new world, uh, and they they want to be ready for the for 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 the next revolution. Um, I guess um, I, I'll I'll uh, I can I can I can have a go at it. I, I think uh, obviously if you uh, have a, a, math, a mathematically mathematical bent. Or uh, computer science bent that uh, that may uh, uh, that is helpful, but I don't think that's essential or required. Uh, I think you you do need to understand data very well. You need to understand what uh, the meaning of the data that you are put putting in, and how you how this is handled. And you need to understand how other people do that as well. And you need to uh, so. So you you probably need to, to be aware of standards that are developing around data, standards that are developing around healthcare, uh, standards which are developing around computer systems. You do not need to know how to code. You just need to know that these exist and what they are used for, and all the, the various bits of jargon associated with, including things like APIs and such. Uh, I, I don't know what whether Rob or Chris want to have had any other thoughts on this matter. Rob. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm just, I'll be tending to the dog in the background here. He got hit by a car a couple of weeks ago, so he's quite demanding. Sorry about that. Yeah, um, I, I think, I think James, those are all fantastic points. I suppose at, at, a, at a more practical level, um, you know, onboarding with a new skill set like AI has never been more feasible. There are some great online courses out there. I mean, I, uh, I personally probably shouldn't make specific recommendations, but I'm going to anyway. Um, Someone called Andrew Eng, who's a professor at Stanford. There's a great course on Coursera, which is a brilliant place to get started. Other courses are available, um, but um, I, otherwise, yeah, James, I think I think your points are valid. Like a, a, an understanding of good clinical science, clinical data, and, and how clinical studies are run is indispensable. And, and it's easy to skip, right? It's easy to use AI injudiciously in this space. Um, Chris, you, you you probably have some thoughts on this, right? I was going to say exactly the same thing. I think Andrew Ng's course is brilliant. That there actually there are two. There's one that's quite quite old, but it's also which, which is brilliant. It like takes you right to the like the fundamentals. Actually, it's very little about deep learning, mostly about sort of machine learning techniques. Really worth doing if you can, um, make, uh, you know, uh, get the enthusiasm because it's quite long, but it's really good. Um, and there's a, he's enough a following one called Deep Learning AI, which is more deep learning based, but it's also very good. Um, I was also just going to say there's no substitute for actually doing a project. And so I was thinking, you know, if you happen to be at King's, you have the AI Centre, maybe you can find someone to, maybe you can join in, help with the project um, or start up if you're somewhere else. You know, just getting some experience in the real world of trying to do these projects, I think is really invaluable. And if you imagine later on, I don't know, doing a PhD or, or working for a company, you know, having some really good experience that you can talk about is invaluable. So I think that's would be a, another thing to say. Yeah. Um, so that... I thought there was uh, there's a very good question actually in the Q&A section about uh, as a nurse with in an interest in AI, I find it quite difficult to find nurses interested in this topic and actually implementing this at the clinical level due to culture and clinical limitations of workload. I tend to actually do this on my own spare time during hackathons and self-learning, so he's uh, probably uh, taking your advice already in advance. And it's so much fun to work collaboratively with others. Um, so. I guess it's kind of an explanation of how uh, someone uh, is able to do this uh, on their own free time through sheer passion, really. And I think most of us here are enthusiasts, even even the people who are relatively new to this. Uh, that's why we're here. If you, and so we are kind of a, almost a self-selecting cohort, and it'd be good to kind of expand uh, this uh, conversation to the people who are perhaps uh, not aware of it or not as enthusiastic as yet. Um, and so to a certain extent, I think 
there is an a, a element of self-selection, but I think we ha we have to be a bit of evangelical about it as well to, to get uh, our colleagues and peers interested in this area. Uh, I don't know if any others in the, cl the clinical Vachalan, uh, or others in the clinical innovators network might want to comment on how this forum might help that. Yeah, I think um, just to give you a summary about the innovation network is the aim is to be uh, leaders in, in, in innovations. The same way you have people who have deep research expertise, who learn research uh, in the nursing structure and the same with education, the innovation in itself is a theme that is foundational to healthcare when we start having champions and it's new uh, and it's exciting because it's new but it may be that for the first few years that you are really championing this within your department. Um, there are two ways I think potentially helpful for your case. So we had Shauna Butler speak at the first time and she's got a quite a good podcast and also an online group for nurse, for nurse innovators. She's a nurse economist herself and an MBA. Um, so she, that's quite a good online club for nurse innovators. And number two, I think innovation is kind of exciting because it's so cross-sectional and that actually you don't want everyone just being doctors and nurses and being in their own silos. Actually, you only get great insights when you see the nurse saying, well, actually, how I assess risk is this way. And the physician saying, well, how I assess risk is this way. And the manager going, well, it's not going to work unless we do X, Y, Z operationally. And actually what you need is nurses talk to technicians and technical experts, talk to the physicians and talk to the managers, everyone huddling together. So you may find allyship from non-traditional structures and actually breaking out of your own silos of your technical expertise or your clinical specialty is actually quite encouraged. And I think if we can use clinical innovators network to find like-minded individuals and be agnostic to what roles and titles you have in the institution, the better for it. But there are some specialty specific and role specific um, innovator networks out there. And we try to be as collaborative and, and kind of uh, diverse as possible, but watch the space. And we're, we're trying to have some events at the, at the foundry going forward. Uh, and that will kind of produce some networking type uh, opportunities as well. So once we move on to a face to face type uh, model, there'll be more kind of casual drinks. Uh, uh, so you probably say, probably say drink, um, but the foundry is quite keen to house the innovators network uh, on their kind of location and help sponsor some of the events. So we will do some peer to peer networking as well soon. OK. Uh all right, uh, let's see that there is a, a specific question from Jack Ross. I think this is for Chris around the retinal imaging example of taking up de divisive cases to get clearer ground, ground truth is interesting. Do you think it will result in a less robust model, AI model? That's a, it's a, it's a good technical question. question. <laughs> it's a good question. I've, I've been mulling it over. I don't think that's the case. It's, it's interesting that the um, because there are some cases where people just really can't agree. So if you give it to 10 specialists and they all give a different answer, that probably isn't the best training example because if no one can agree, then uh, you know it's, it, it's probably going to be negative rather than additive on your training algorithm. So yeah, I think we have tried including an and excluding, and I think just it tends to work better when it's included. When when you give a model then um, a, a borderline case, it, it it does tend to give results that are borderline. And so the, one of the interesting things is do models make very confident wrong predictions and that's something we want to avoid really because a confident wrong prediction is someone that doesn't really understand their field and that's a kind of safety a safety thing we'd like to avoid so it's a really good question is um, I guess it requires a lot more thought I think this is one of the areas in the next 10 years we might learn a lot more about is sort of how models give confidence how you how you avoid um, confident wrong errors in data that are outside of the data that were used to train originally and that's one of the one of the hardest things. If you can imagine, like, um, it does make sense. Imagine you're a an A and E doctor in London, and you move to Malawi, and you and you but you, you didn't realise that you were just sort of transported from London to Malawi. So you sort of I don't know, you were sort of knocked out, and you woke up in Malawi, and suddenly you're in your new A and E department, and so a child comes in with a fever. You probably have got a very different set of differentials compared to if you're in London. And if you just kept going London way, it it wouldn't work. You know, and you need to recognise that oh, this is actually quite different to what I've been used to before, and retrain a bit. And so, the how you know how you can generalise algorithms between is like a really interesting problem. So I think all of these things together are sort of fertile grounds for investigation in the next few years. Okay, I've I've got a a, a more challenging question for the, the whole panel, uh, which I've uh, decided to devise for myself. So AI has had many dawns in the last fifty. 
50 years. In the 1950s, AI was going to be everywhere in the 90s and the 80s as well, and now in the 2010s. Um, and it, it's always been followed by a winter, in our winter. It, when are we going to get our next winter? Rob, Chris? That's a, that's a great question, James. You, you clearly concocted that one with a big evil grin on your face. Yeah, I, I, I may, maybe maybe I'm a hopelessly naively optimistic, but I, I think we're probably I think we probably had the last AI winter. I mean, I, I think there are two halves to this response. One is that AI is already everywhere. Like you might not know it, but I mean, it, it, it's already part of your everyday life, uh, machine learning and AI algorithms. And um, whether, you know, whether we're going to see sort of, you know, Skynet type AI taking over the world within our lifetime, you know, what we call generalizable AI. Yeah, I, I don't know, but I mean, there, there are cars driving themselves around the streets of California right now. I mean, it's hard to argue that AI is not here to stay. The second thing I would say, though, to, in response to that, is that the definition of AI is always changing because intelligence itself is such a nebulous concept. What was, you know, there was once when the digital calculator was probably thought of as the cutting edge of AI, and then it was computer programs we now think is being hopelessly out of date. I, th I think good AI is no longer called AI, and that's the trick. Uh, I'll probably stop there because that's probably the cleverest thing I'm going to say this evening. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Chris, any any comments about that? Oh, I thought that was a very good answer, actually. I mean, it's a question I wonder myself, actually. I mean, yeah, it's everywhere around us, isn't it? I mean, just the fact that you can now search for, you know, a blue boat and find all the blue boats in your photograph, that, that's not going away, I think. So I think that side is here to stay. In healthcare, though, you know, there's so much promise. I wonder how much that promise will translate into reality in the short term. And I think probably it's things like generalizability and um, like that's probably, I, I, I don't know, there, there are lots of things, but there are, that's one of the big things I think that might hold us up. Also just having really high quality evaluations in time before a lot of these startups they run out of funding. I think you know it takes a long, it takes much longer than anyone might have imagined, I think, to get something into patient care. And I, it just the question is whether the people who are running these companies will have enough appetite and funding to get them there. Because it does just take a long time for clinicians to get enough evidence to make themselves confident that what they're doing is safe. You know, it takes years for pharma to do this. How can we accelerate that for AI in a safe way? I think that's a big question. Okay, um, we've got an, a, a very good question from David Bowen. Um, the examples given seems to be directed at high tech problems. What about applying AI to low tech problems? For example, detecting vulnerable people in need of early intervention. Um, I'm going to give a go at this. Uh, so um, I, I don't think that's necessarily a low tech problem. I don't think this is uh, because detecting what, what defines how do you tell someone is vulnerable depends on the data about them. And so if they're miss, if the data is recorded, if there are sensors everywhere on the streets uh, and detecting uh, whether someone is uh, 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 sleeping rough on the streets, then perhaps what, that would be a way of detecting whether they're vulnerable. But if, if a person does not have the data captured somehow by some sort of sensor system or recorded uh, in uh, electronic health record or in a social care record, then uh, if the data is missing, then it's, it's not really going to, an AI is, isn't really going to be able to learn anything from it if the data is missing. So I guess it's, a, it's about actually uh, getting the data of these vulnerable people into the right setting and analyze. And as we know, most of social care uh, still rely on pieces of paper or in uh, or on lots of little data silos or spreadsheets and such. So it's I suspect it's not really a low tech, it's not a low tech issue. I think it's the issue is that we don't the, the data is uh, systems that we have do not have have not reached the space where people are vulnerable in. Uh, I, I thought that'd give it. Uh, anyone else want to say anything else, else about that? No. Uh, well, I, I know I agree. I think I think the the pro the things we've talked about so far are all very constrained problems. Where you know, so like screening is a great example where screening has like rigorous guidelines that have been set up over thirty years, so that the retinal photograph is exactly like this, or the mammogram is bang on like this, and there are quality assurance guidelines. You know. The, the, the images are very standardized, which makes it a perfect machine learning problem. But say detecting vulnerable people in need of early intervention, it's actually a really complex problem that requires like multimodal data that isn't captured at digitally at the moment. It like it's really, really hard problem to solve. So I think actually almost what we're the, the current things we're talking about are kind of the low-hanging fruit, the easy problems. And actually, 
there are these much harder problems that will come later. All right. Um, Alex uh, uh, has a question about whether AI medicine will be a distinct specialty in the future, or do you think it will integrate it within each medical specialty? Do you think the body of knowledge is distinctive enough to require its own curriculum and certification? Hmm. Well, uh, I, I, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think it will be its, its own distinct specialty. Um, I think it will be medical. It'll, it's the same way that we don't really have a distinct specialty of medical statistics. Uh, we don't really have a distinct specialty of um, uh, uh, of uh, people who handle uh, 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 EHRs, perhaps. So I, I think it will be integrated into uh, within each specialty, uh, and you probably have skills that you learn and acquire as you go along, rather than uh, a whole certification as a whole degree or something like that. You, you acquire skill sets, and the Faculty of Clinical Informatics, the FCI uh, in the UK, is trying to set something like that up. With respect to that, I, I, what, what do you think, Rob? Yeah, I I I think I agree mostly with what you're saying. <clears throat> I also think that that the greatest need for dual literacy in, in medicine and AI is, is now. And by the same token that, you know, AI will become, we'll refer to it less as AI as it becomes integrated in everyday medical practice, so that need will fade. I think right now there is a desperate need to bridge that knowledge gap, uh, which harks back to the original question about do clinicians have something to add to AI, which I think you two answered beautifully. Um, yes, they do. Not only that, but they're absolutely essential because AI is going nowhere until we get clinical buy-in and clinical acumen and understanding as a clinical ecosystem on board to drive the implementation. So, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to become specialty in itself, but I would also say right now I would strongly encourage any clinicians with an interest in this space to take a deep dive because now's the time. Okay. Uh, and uh, there was a question earlier on which I uh, I. I I missed earlier. It was from Kapil. He was wondering about a common jargon and terminology amongst nurses, doctors, and clinics and hospital staff. Can, uh, do they think that this problem can be solved by AI? Uh, and so, uh, and whether or not you can transform a document into a standard terminology document. Um, I, I think actually that's uh, uh, surprisingly. I, I had initially thought in my career that this would be a, a very hard problem. But actually, this problem is actually probably not as hard as I expected with the progress of national language processing uh, and not, um, international standards around uh, terminologies. So a lot of these terminologies are actually already in use in some hospitals, certainly in North America, like SNOMED. Uh, it's, I, I think it's just in the United Kingdom, we have perhaps left a lot of this standardized vocabularies and not kept up to speed with them. At least standardized vocabularies do exist. And uh, I think uh, over time, we will start to use more and more of this standardized vocabulary, and we will have um, translation systems to translate some of these, vocab these vocabularies between vocabularies, for example. Um, and so I, I think it's certainly uh, an achievable goal. But I guess the issue is training our staff to be familiar to, to these vocabularies and for us to be to embed them into our uh, the curriculum that we learn in the university and such, because at the moment, uh, a lot of, uh, I think a lot of courses, uh, uh, medical uh, courses and nursing courses and HP courses still do not cons uh, do not teach about these terminologies as yet. It, it is, they are kind of left in a, in a kind of a dry bit of ICD-10 uh, bits, which are clinical coding and boring things like that. Uh, so I, I, I had a go with that and so next is uh, Anako Eche. How soon will we see AI being used to support initial reading of breast mammography, particularly in light of the shortage of radiologists and the aging UK population? Well, um, Chris, Rob? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm happy to take it and kick it over to Chris. I mean, I mean it's already happening, right? Um, you know, we, we already have people in sort of stage four clinical trials. Um, you know, I, to, to plug one, you know, Chiron Medical is a company we work very closely in the UK. They got one of the NHS AI grants um, who, who are doing mammography. Uh, how how long until it's going to be like absolutely routine? I, I don't know, but not that long. Like the technology's there. It's going through the governance and the regulatory hurdles. It makes sense as a business case. I mean, like I, I, it's not going to be long at all. 
Uh, Chris, maybe you can refine that that very vague estimate. <laughs> no, I think it's good. I mean, they're, they're like lots of promise. They're, it's actually, I think it's probably one of the most popular AI applications. You know, it's, it's like a really nice problem to work on. So there's like many companies around the world who've been working on this. And it's interesting that like the, the National Screening Program released a, a document uh, a month ago, or a paper actually in the BMJ, so talking about is the evidence base good enough? And they feel not. So, but like James said, like, like Rob says, like it is, um, it's like a, it's a good one, and I, I'm sure it will see it quite soon. But they just need a higher burden of evidence. The National Screening Committee, it seems, they, um, they, you know, they want to make sure that things are okay before they introduce them. Historically, have been quite uh, very conservative. So in this case, we have to be a little bit more, a little bit less conservative. If we want to see it, get that out sooner. And NHSX is doing a great job of sort of funding evaluative projects to try and find out more. So I don't, a timeline, though, I don't know. I would hope in the next few years, though. Oh, um, uh, a, a much more challenging future forecasting question. How long do you think it is before you're happy to have an AI make a clinical decision for a patient rather than being used for decision support? Um, well, um, I guess the moment I pr I'm prepared to press the autopilot button on my car, uh, that probably be, would probably be the day that I guess um, I'd be I, I think that I've probably crossed that threshold already by that point. Uh, I, I, what, what do you think, Chris? I, I think it depends on what sort of decision it is. I, I, I liked the example at the very beginning. That was a, that was a great example. But I think if it was um, you know, someone walking into a GP clinic and sitting down and, and asking a question, I would feel anxious about the AI making a decision. Like, you know, 90% of it's how they come in, how they sit down, what they say. Did you get that thing they didn't want to mention out of them that they, um, you know, came with but were too embarrassed to say or something? I don't think that AI's got everything that a GP does. So I don't know. I think it could, I think it may be quite a long time in some settings, but I've been today for others. So <laughs> there's, there's a hand wavy answer. Okay, um, so I, I've done the asking of questions. Chris, Rob, do you want do, do you want to ask me tough questions or or yeah, bring something that you want to kind of uh, uh, discuss on the floor for this panel be, before we kind of close up? We've got a few, maybe about a minute or so left. I'll be interested in what the biggest challenges there are for you as someone within a hospital system who's enthusiastic about this, bringing them into a clinical setting like what, what are the biggest challenges and how could we improve them um i i think uh it's infrastructure and people are that I, I which is bigger problem i think well i think they're both equally large i think infrastructure can't be built without people so i think it's people uh and you need people like the people here uh in in this uh attending this event as well as uh, all the other people who are not attending this event to really understand the benefits and really understand how to 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 work with uh, informatic systems, and how to understand uh, to understand that many of these systems need to be plugged into each other, and how to facilitate them, and that these uh, they are not kind of standalone systems. And I think there's a strong temptation to just uh, go and buy the, the snazziest thing you see in a in a show or uh, the trade show or something like that and realize it actually doesn't really work very well because your organization isn't ready and it's usually not ready because the infrastructure isn't ready and it's because the infrastructure isn't ready because the people aren't ready and I, I i think that's the biggest issue for using ai making ai is just it's an issue of, of for people as, as i've described before, it's about being able to handle the data uh, in large volumes in a scalable way uh, we have to do this in real time. Uh, yes, uh, Dave, David uh, uh, has that question. Uh, comment is definitely right. You could need to harness the data in real time. Uh, you need to uh, block the systems all together so the data all streams to a common source. Uh, and often, uh, sometimes the, the temptation to buy a new product or a new system ends up uh, kind of creating data silos, which actually make, puts you several steps backwards. Uh, and so, trying to get the, the common mission amongst everyone to, to try to accomplish this. And it, it, this is a change transformation issue more than anything else. In banking every in banking and other industries, people kind of eventually got that because everyone understood that, that they were all headed in that direction. Um, that's my, my 
that's my thoughts about it. And uh, the infrastructure and the people are, are key. OK, I think that's all the time we've got left for this uh, this evening. Um, I, I, uh, I think that there is another planned event uh, next month. Uh, and uh, Dan, uh, I, I think Danny Rutter um, and uh, others will be uh, discussing in the next uh, event. Um, if you need to, uh, if you don't want to miss the next event, then obviously uh, subscribe to the event bright uh, events for more information. Um, but we will obviously disseminate this along as we go along. And this is all recorded, and I'm, I'm sure uh, the team here will disseminate this in due course. And I'd like to thank Chris and Rob for sparing their evenings. And um, I, I'd hope to catch up with everyone in person as well myself in the future. Uh, all right. Um, I, goodbye, everyone. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming. Thanks. All right.